All right, welcome back everyone to our third lecture of the uh, introduction to programming with R. Um, I asked you before, but again, in case that you guys have any questions about the previous lectures or the assignment, so that you guys are working on it. Um, all right. So today we're going to continue talking about some fundamental blocks of programming and the topics for today are flow control, what we call flow control instructions and vectors. So we're going to be talking about loops uh, and conditionals. Those are the main flow con control instructions in, in programming and then vectors, which is a very powerful data structure in, in R. So, there are some basic building blocks in any programming language. And of course, these are also present in R. Looping construct, which allow us to have instructions, computations, and, and, and code that is being uh, repeated, that is done repeatedly by the computer. Conditionals to handle decision making, like instruct our code to do something or, or something else, depending on, on a condition. And then the ability to group commands into functional units like functions or scripts and of course of course r has all of these features available for us to to implement the functions we we saw the the grouping we saw using the curly braces and what we're going to be talking about today is the looping constructs and, and the conditions plus the vectors at the end so loops are are a feature of all programming programming languages or more programming languages and it's basically a programming structure that allows us to, to execute the same chunk of code over and over again. Each time this code is run, uh, one or more variables can change the value, that's ideal, otherwise you are just repeating the same thing over and over. And so allowing for the slightly different behaviors in each iteration of, of the loop. So every time that you repeat something, it's called an iteration in the loop. This allows for more efficient writing of code since you don't need to copy and, and, and paste code, something that we say we shouldn't do either way because of functions. Uh, but if you had to repeat exactly the same part of code, you can, you can loop over the code block. Um, as with most coin structure, loops can be inside other loops. So they can have nested loops. And we're going to see examples of this. So let's take a look at some of the examples. Um, so in this case, we're going to define a vector or, or, or a combination of words in the vector B, word hello, word from A vector. So if I ask for what is B, so it's all these words. And then we are going to loop. So this part here is, is where the for loop, the, the looping happens. So we are going to say for and then open parentheses and then I in B. So this is i, in this case is what we call a looping variable. It means that i will take the value of each of the entries in the vector. So by saying i in b, we are saying, okay, take i, get the value of hello and execute whatever come after in my code block. So the first time is hello. The second time is the word word. So it's going to print war. So this code block is just printing to the screen with a new line at the end. Third time is from, fourth time is the letter A, and fifth time is the word vector. So basically by looping over the elements in this vector, we can actually grab this, this um, each of the elements and perform an action with it. In this case, as, as I was saying, the action is nothing else than just printing in the screen, but you can imagine it can be something else. It can be a computation of, of, of a given kind. Alternative, you can define, you can loop over a list. So any kind, any of the of the enumerable types of uh, data structures that we have in our list, vectors, data frames can be looped over. So for J in, and I'm defining on the same uh, for conditional, the, the, the structure list composed by the word cow, the number one and the Boolean false, and then print that to the screen. Same thing as before. So now we will say cow one and false. Okay, any questions so far about the for loop? So this is the simplest case where you just loop over, you repeat the same action over uh, a number of elements in a set. In this case, the set can be a vector or a list. 
it's one of the important uh, structures in programming. So again, something important to bear in mind. There is another type of looping structure. This is called a while loop. And in this case, the, the call block, so the, here is a word while loop, the call block repeats itself until the condition that is, is written in the parentheses is, is satisfied. So the example here goes as we, we take a word variable i and we assign one to that. And then we say, while i is smaller than four, then perform whatever is defined in our code block. So in this case, it's printing i and then incrementing i by one. So in this case, we enter the for loop, the, sorry, the while loop with i equal to one. Is i smaller than one, than four, sorry? Yes, it is. We print i, that's one. We increment i by one. So next time that we ask the question, is i smaller than four, we, i will have the value of two. And then print i, increment i by one, it will have the value of three. Print i, increment i by one, and have the value of four, and then when it has the value of four, then it's not more or smaller than four. So we don't we don't uh, continue executing the code block. Notice that what happened with the for, uh, with the while loop is every time that we hit the closing uh, code block, we come back and evaluate the condition at the top. So this code block continues until the condition is is not satisfied. So that is important to to bear in mind. So for instance, do not run this example because this example is is going to repeat forever. So while true, the condition true is always true. And then while true, cat, hello, a new line. So we'll print hello until 11. So if you decide to write this, press Control C to break. So this is what we call an infinite loop. It's one of the typical bugs, errors that we can uh, have when coding with loops is that your code, your, your loop never ends, okay? So we saw these two different types, the for loop, the for loop is, is used when you have a concrete number of instances that you know you want to repeat. So you, you, you loop over the elements, for instance, and you repeat that. Or the while loop, which is a, a, a loop that you repeat the code block until a given condition is, is not satisfied anymore or until the condition is satisfied, depending how you write the condition. Okay, so the two different ways of looping in R. Um, any, any questions about this? It's a third way of looping in R, but it's not so useful. It's called repeat. Um, so we will not we will not cover it. The most useful ones are the for loop or the while loop. Those two cover most of the cases where you want to repeat things. And again, computers are really good at repeating things. They don't get tired as us most of the time, at least. So uh, you can you, you will certainly find or will find these instructions. Uh, these, these constructors in, in calls that you will write or use. Okay. So those were our loops. Let's talk about conditionals. We saw this when we were talking about, uh, or part of this when we were talking about Boolean variables. So conditionals are used to ask questions. So for instance, can I can ask the question, is the word pants equal to blue? And of course, I will say, no, these two strings are different. One is pants, it has these five characters, and the other is blue, has four characters, quite distinctive from, from pants, so it's false. I can ask now the same question, but use an if statement. So the conditional if statement will allow me to do one thing or another depending on a Boolean condition. So if pants equal blue, then I'm going to print cat J for pants. But we know that pants equal blue is false. So because it's false, then this statement is not going to be satisfied. So the word that the if statement works is if the condition that follows the if command is true, the code block that follows that is executed. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do to exemplify this a little bit more is combine to uh, with our previous uh, construct um, with the for command. So we are going to loop, we're going to loop over a vector one, two, and three. And then within the code block of the for, of the for loop, I'm going to uh, place a if statement. And I'm going to ask if the i variable, the uh, looping variable is smaller than two, then print the looping variable. And if not, just continue, carry on with the loop. So what will happen is at the first entry, 
in the for loop, I will have the value of one. In the if statement, is one smaller than two? Yes, it is, so it prints one. Then in the second instance, I will have the value of two. It will ask, is two smaller than two? And that is false because two is equal to two, so it won't print i. If three is smaller than two, that's the next part of the for loop, is not true, so it only prints one, this combination of the for and the if statement. Any questions about this? This is again, it's a, it's a simple, but really quite relevant and important uh, logic behind uh, coding. So if you if you understand this, we are in good in good shape. Uh, but if you don't, that's probably uh, it's, a, it's probably a really good moment to to mention this, and we can go over this example. So a different one, uh, so we can try to clarify this. Uh, I have a question for the for yes, me. please go ahead. Um, so uh, this, when you specify i, um, uh, this would call the actual uh, content in in that index point, right? Um, so if you want to just if you want to know the index value itself, how would you uh, get that? Excellent question, um, uh, Kim. So you are asking, like, for instance, in the example one, two, three, the index coincides with the value. Yes. Right. There is a function in R called seek along. I think we are going to see an example of this. And seek along will give you uh, the indices of the, of the individual elements. But right now, in the way that the for loop works, you are accessing the actual values and not the indices. By using seek along of whatever is the element, you get the actual indices. All right. Okay. Make sense? Yep. OK. okay. If, if we don't have an example, remind me, and we come back, and I show you a light demo of that, OK? Okay, it's a good question. Good point because sometimes it's as as Kim was mentioning, is 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 a good thing to access the indices of the elements in the array or the list because we may want to do something else with them. So it's a good point. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, just a quick reminder. I think we talk about this very quickly when we talk about the booleans functions. But you can perform all kind of comparisons. Like is two smaller than three, you will use the smaller than symbol, and that will be you three. Uh, will be true, sorry. If R is different from legs, and because we are comparing strings, that's true because these two things are different. But then we can use the ampersand or or vertical line to use and and ors to combine conditionals, to combine logic expressions. Like for instance, if two is smaller than three and R is different from legs, so this is true because these two these two previous conditions are true. If two is smaller than three and arms equal to leg, that's false because one of the conditions is not true anymore. So this is, is, is Boolean logic, if you wish. Or is two is smaller than three or arms equal to leg, that's true because two is smaller than three, although arms is not equal to legs. Okay, so these are going to be important. The uh, ampersand and, and vertical operator because they will allow us to create more complex uh, conditional, more complex logical expressions. Okay, so bear those in mind. So we're going to look at one more example. And now what we're going to see is also is how to, so I told you the if statement allows you to execute one thing depending on a conditional or another thing. And so for doing that, what we need to introduce is the else statement. So the if statement, is as we saw before, is the condition, then the code block that we execute if the condition is satisfied, but we can also add a second part to the if statement, which is the else part. So we can do if condition, execute if the condition is satisfied, else execute if the condition is not satisfied. So for instance, if my condition is pants equal to blue, we saw this is false, so the condition is not satisfied, we can say, Okay, this statement will not be satisfied because the pants are not blue or not equal to blue. Else, we are going to say it's boo for pants. So when we execute this code block, when we execute the if statement, we are going to hit this cat statement because this condition is not satisfied. So we come to the else if we execute the code block associated with the else. Is this clear? You are going to see a more complicated example combining the if and the else and the for loop just in a second. So it's, it's important that we see if this is, I'm going to, uh, in an incremental manner, um, add, adding more elements to the example. So it's important that if the if else structure is not clear, we, we talk about this now. 
all right? So as I say, let's, let's combine our for loop with the if statements and an if else condition. So we are going to loop again in uh, through our one, two, three example. We have this before. If i was smaller than two, we were printing the value of i. And now what we're going to say is cat too big, too big with respect to two, right? So i takes the first value one, one is smaller than two, we print i, that's our one right here. We hit the, the end of the loop, we come back to the top, next element is two. So two is smaller than two, no, it is not. Then we come to the else and we execute the call block of the else. So in this case is print too big. And then we get too big because I was two. We hit the end of the for loop, we come back to the top. Now we take the value of the third element, that's three. If three is smaller than two, that's not true. So we come to our else statement and execute that print too big again. Okay, again, simple kind of a straightforward example, but I would really appreciate and it's going to be really important if you guys let me know if something is not quite clear right now. Uh, Sina has a question. Is there a less than equal symbol in R? Yes, it is. So you can combine actually uh, a smaller or equal by just typing and going to type it in the chat. You do uh, a smaller equal or you do greater equal. So that's, that's how you ask for equality. And you do double equal sign for, for actual equality. So that's, that's how we, we will do it. Well, I think we're going to see an example about that too. Okay, good question. All right, so let's do one more example. And this is just to exemplify a couple of things. It's just to, to practice our Boolean logic but also to see that you can concatenate several else if statements together, all right? So we are going to loop through a list of five elements, one, two, three, four, and five, and then we are going to have an if statement, okay? That if statement, we have an if else condition, but then it will concatenate with another if else condition, which will concatenate with another if else condition, all right? So let's go through it. So I'm going to loop through the list. My first element is number one. So I, when I enter the for loop has I equal one. It will ask if I, if one is smaller than two, true. So I'm going to print I, that's a one. And then I go into exit here and then it doesn't go into any of the other conditions because I already satisfy my, my if statement. So it hits the true for the for the then and doesn't touch any of the other else okay because these are exclusive so these else if conditions are all nested within the else of the first if there's another way to indent this i like more but for due to to a space I, I i wasn't able to do it but i may show you if we have time at the end so it's more clear that these are that's why uh indentation matters it can clarify a little bit the code okay so we got the first element. Second element is number two, value of two. So I enter my first if statement. If two is smaller than two, no, it's equal. So I hit my second if statement and it says, is I equal to three? And it is not because I is two. So I, I hit my third if statement. Is I greater than three? It is not because it's two. So I hit my last else statement. I say, no good. And that's the second thing that you see printed in this loop, okay? Come back, find, reach the end of the loop, come back to the top. I is three now. Is I is three smaller than two? It is no, I come to my else. Is three equal to three? Oh yeah, it is. So I print go three and hit the end of the loop. Come back to the top. Next value is four. Four is smaller than two, it is not come to my else. If four equal to three, no, come to my else. If four greater than three, oh yes, it is. So I print four. That's your four right here. End of the loop, come back, reach the last element, number five. Five is smaller than two, no, hit my else statement. Five equal to three, no, hit my other else statement. Five greater than three, yes, I print five. End of the loop no more elements to process, end of the process. 
Okay. Is this clear? Any questions about this? If you got this, this is not the most complicated logic, but it's complicated enough that I'm, I'm sure that if you follow this example and you are able to understand the logic behind, I am sure that you got the main things about else if statements and, and, and looping. One thing I should notice, you may have noticed that I always write the closing call block of my if statement. And then if there is an else, an else, write it right there. Well, that is, that's a restriction, it's a constraint in the way that the syntax work in R. So don't write your code block and then put the else statement in the next line, it will give you an error, okay? You need to call, close the code block of the if statement and then write right away your else statement, otherwise it won't work. Okay. All right. Okay. If you guys don't have any questions, we're going to talk about vectors now. All right. So, but one last chance um, about looping and conditions. And I think, I think, um, before I forget, let me, because um, I think Kim was asking about. Um, a second. I'm going to stop my share for a second. I promise that we're going to see an example of sequence along. Um, okay, here we go. I want to show you. It may it may still be in our second part of the vector. Um, let me. Let's go over this in a second and open a terminal so we can have. Okay, so let me share my screen again. So, can you guys see this is my, my, um, my other terminal. So I'm going to find vector one to be, let me make the font bigger. Can you guys see? Is, is, is good the font? Yes. Perfect, thank you. So I'm going to find vector one, two, three, four, five, six, and maybe 11 just to don't make all the numbers consecutive. And then the function I was talking about was sequence along, sequence along vector one. What give you is instead of for if I ask for vector one, I get the values. But if I use sequence along, then I get the um, I get the indices. So why I could do that? Well, I was saying one of my examples before was for i my looping variable in vector one. I'm going to open a code block. Then I was saying um, let's make it a little bit more interesting. A square root print the square root of the of the value and then a new line just to separate things and then that what it does is it take each of the values one two and computes uh, the square root and as you can see in the fourth element is four so it gets two and so on but now if i do if i do instead my for loop with sequence along and then i do um let's do the same operation the square root what is going to return actually is the square root of the index, index of the element. So one is one, two is the square root of two, square root of three. It, it, it differs on, um, on the last element because it doesn't match the index. So it's, it's seven. We can do just to make it more clear, just print the value of the looping variable instead. And you can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the question is, Count, I also recover the value, for instance, and, and, and yes, you can, because now only thing you, you need to do is um, just add some separators there, but say from vector one, give me the element i, because that's my index now. And now you get the index on one column and then the actual value of the vector in the other column, okay? Again, I mentioned this because I think it's, it's something that it can be useful in some cases. All right, and a little bit of extra looping examples. Now, 
Um, let's carry on with um, with the second part of the lecture, which is vectors. And the reason why I, I also had vectors here is because um, go full screen with the slides is because in one way by using vectors we can avoid doing um, um, operations related to vectors we can avoid doing loopings uh, and conditionals and that's what we are going to see with with vectors as well so vectors are one of the composite types in r we saw the primitive types if you remember but we also talk about different ways to combine primitive types least the uh, data frames and vectors was one of them. So vectors are what we call homogeneous uh, because they need to have, they must have all the same type. Uh, the elements in the vector must have all the same type. They are compact and they are not nested. So it means you cannot have one, one vector inside another vector. That's a difference with lists. If you remember, lists can have different types, but also they can have nested lists, like the ones that you had to create for, for the assignment. So example of how to create vectors is using the C function. So I can create a vector A with the numbers one, two, three, or I can create a vector as we saw at the beginning, B with, the, with different words. And these are vectors because all of them are the same type, numbers or strings, okay? And if I ask for the structure of B, then it says it's characters one to five, and then it lists the values. Another way to create vectors is to use the colon operator, which means it will generate a range of values from the beginning, the first element up to the end. So one to 17 in this case. Um, so the C command combines values into a vector list, or you can do it with the colon operator. That's different ways of creating a vector. You can also use the array function. I don't remember if we saw that, but it's another way. So there are different ways in which you can create vectors or arrays. Those are uh, the same thing. One colon 10, for instance, if you write one colon 10, it gives you the values one to 10. Seek, the sequence function is another one. In sequence, you can specify the beginning, the end, and the stride. So it will go from two to 20, every four. So it starts at two, six, 10, 14, and 18, until reach the value of 20, although 20 may not be part of the sequence. Another way to create, uh, to create vectors is to combine them combine different types by using the paste function. Paste combine things together um, because it's a, it's a function mostly for strings. It will combine them into a string. So you can do paste the letter A and then one to five. One to five, as we saw before, will create the sequence of values one to five. So what it does is it repeats whatever is the smaller element, in this case, A, which is only one, five times to match the one to five. Now you can indicate the separator a separator between them. If you indicate quotation, quotation means it's an empty separator, it's no separator, and then you get the A1, A2, A3, A4, and 5. It's a nice way to create uh, samples names if you need to. Another way is to create repetitions. So you can use rep for creating repetitions, and letters is, is, um, is a set in R uh, that represents the letters uh, of the alphabet. And then you can say, give me the letters one to five, and then it will give you A, B, C, D, and E, and then it says, repeat these three times. So when you execute this, you get A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, and A, B, C, D, E. So three repetitions of the letters one, uh, one to five, meaning A, B, C, D, E, okay? If you want to check if one of the variables is a vector, that is the is vector function, and you can see that the range one to 10 is indeed a vector because if you ask is vector of one to 10, this sequence is a vector because it's homogeneous in the sense all are numbers and are comp it's a composite, composite type. Now, one of the things why vectors are important and why it's part of this, of this lecture as well is that we can use what we call a slicing. And a slicing is a very efficient way of going through an element, through the elements of a vector and grabbing the elements that hold, that satisfy a given condition. So it's very similar to what we will do with the combination of a for loop and an if statement, but it's way, way faster. So whenever it's possible, not always it's possible, but whenever it's possible, we should be using a slicing instead of looping and conditionals combined. So let's see an example. 
A is a vector, as we defined before, the sequence of numbers between 2 and 20 every 4. So it will give you 2, 6, 10, 14, and 18. If I want the fourth element, I can do A bracket 4, and that returns 14. It's the fourth element in the sequence. It's like the index number 4, as we were discussing before. But I can also do the following. I can combine the operator, the column operator, which gives me a range of values. So two column four give me the values two, three, and four. And I can do A bracket two column four, meaning A, two, three, and four. That gives me the three elements in the second, third, and fourth position of the vector A. This is called a slicing. Grabbing more than one element by just indicating several indices is what we call a slicing. We are a slicing, taking the values, the slices of the vector. I can slice a vector, this, the vector A, by other vector, by using another vector of indices. So in this case, C124, it will give me the first, second, and fourth element of the vector. And this is also a slicing. I can do the complement of a vector. So I can say A bracket and then minus the elements I don't want. So in this case, by doing minus one, two, three, I'm going to get only the fourth and fifth element of the vector, okay? And finally, I can slice the vector with a sequence of values. One, five, two will give me the sequence one, three, and five. And so what I'm getting from this is the elements one, three, and five of the vector. So all these are examples of slicing a vector, okay? How you will do any of these examples? In, in a for loop approach, well, imagine you will loop over the elements of the vector and then ask, okay, if the index equal to four, then print four, right? So implies on the one hand more code, not so easy to see because I can, for here in this case is, is, is clear I want the fourth element of the vector or the, four, the second, third and fourth element of the vector. And then I had, if I were doing a for loop implementation, I had the for loop and the conditional. So it's not as clean implementation, but also it's not as efficient. A slicing is just one operation. It's, it's what we call in computing vectorization, vectorizing the operation. It's just one operation that the computer performs. In the for loop, we are repeating many operations, but on top of that, we are also adding the conditional, asking the question, if something. So whenever possible, whenever it's possible, always use a slicing instead of looping and conditionals combined. And this is why this, this topic is together with the, the control or instructions for controlling the flow of the program. Any questions about this? Okay, let's go back to our Boolean operators that we talked just a second ago. We had, remember the statement, A is smaller than five, right? This returns a true if the value is, is smaller or greater than five. The equal equal is for uh, equality, the exclamation sign equal is for the opposite, is, is when something is different. And then the ampersand and, um, and vertical lines are for, for an and or operators. Now we can ask the question, I'm using still the same example as before, A is 2, 6, 10, 14, and 8, and 18, sorry. I can ask the question, is A smaller than 8? And then what I will get is it is true. So what this, this instruction is, in, is, is, is being executed in that is asking the condition for each single element in the vector A. So for the first two elements is true because they are smaller than eight. The last three elements is false because are greater than eight. Now, look at this. This is, this is the, the utmost uh, uh, expression of a slicing. It's a slicing a vector based on the vector itself. So in this case, I'm slicing the vector A with the condition where A is smaller than eight. So it's giving me the elements of the vector A such that are smaller than eight. If you want to represent this, if you want to implement this in code, in, a, in for loops, it's quite, not complicated, it's doable, but it will have several lines of code. Here we are doing it just in one line, super, super powerful. I hope that you can see that. It's super powerful the way that we are actually getting the data such that a given condition is satisfied. Um, we can ask other things. Let's create another vector B uh, with different values and then ask where this is equal to 38. And it's, it's not, in any case, it's equal to 38. So we get all falses, 
But now we can start to combine conditions. Can we ask where is B greater than five and B is more than 50? And then we get, okay, uh, greater than five, this one, but not as, and it's smaller than 50, greater than five, smaller than 50, greater than five, smaller than 50, greater than five, but not smaller than 50. So we get the three elements in the middle. And that is what is shown here. It's true in the three elements of the middle of the vector B, okay? Or we can ask, where is B smaller than 10 or B greater than 30? And again, we get results according to the values. This is smaller than 10. This is um, greater than 30. This is greater than 30, okay? And that's why we get true, false, false, true. We can now slice the vector B with this to get the actual values. An equivalent way to do this, some people prefer this, is to use the which function. And the which function, what it will return, this is related to the question that we got before about the sequence along, uh, forgetting the indices, is the difference it will give you the indices of the elements such that satisfy a given condition. So the condition is here, where is B smaller than 10 or greater than 30? Well, we saw before it's the first one, the fourth or the fifth one, and that is what which is telling you, which are the indices that hold the condition that is, is, is written here. Okay, now this way of, again, all these are slicing techniques because we look for a particular condition, a Boolean condition, true or false after all, and then we, we grab the information from that. All this is slicing. Notice that the slicing, again, super powerful, not only applies to vectors, but also to data frames. So remember our trees data frame that we saw like last class? Remember, there were a couple of columns, three columns, girls, height, and volume. Well, look at this. I can ask, give me the data from the tree data frame such that the volume is greater than 56. So trees volume is the column volume of the tree data frame. Greater than 56 is our Boolean conditional. And then slicing the tree data frame with this condition and the comma means give me all the columns. I could pick one particular column or I want all the columns, okay? So again, slicing works also for data frames. Any questions about this? All right. So this is a super important topic, slicing. We're going to use to see a, a few other things about vectors, but you know, four loops, conditionals, and slicings are, are crucial and uh, going to, to, to be part of the next assignments. Uh, it's not needed for the current assignment, but for the following ones, and it's one of the most powerful tools you will see in programming in R in particular. Okay, so let's say that we started with a vector uh, with values one, two, three, but we want to add elements to the vector. How can we do that? Well, we can use this way. We can take the vector A, and combine the vector A with a new element. And then if we want to add one more element, combine the previous vector A and, and assign that to the vector A and combine and so on. This will work. The problem with this is um, it's a slow and it can give you troubles when you are working with very, very long vectors. Why is that? Because in the moment that we say, okay, take the vector A, and combine with a new element and put again on vector A, what R is doing is creating a replica of this vector. So it takes a vector A in this case that has just three elements, it creates a copy of this in memory and then add that, mem add that element. So for a, for a minute in time, a certain period of time, in memory there are two floating two copies of the same vector. If it is a small vector, no big issues, but if we are, talking about a vector that takes half of the memory of the computer, then we may crash our program because at some point in time, there are two copies of the same vector in memory. And if it exceeds the, the size of the physical memory, that will crash your computer. Alternatively, we'll, one could do the following. Length of A give you how many elements are in the vector. Um, we can say, okay, length of A plus one, because I'm adding one element of the vector A, assign something. So this is also bad because in, in internally R will do the same. We'll create a replica of the vector and then add one more element and reassign that to the vector A. Uh, it's funny looking though, but, but um, you know, 
that's, that's a, a different way, but it's still bad. So which is a better way to do that is, is to create a vector with placeholder. So you can use the vector uh, function and say, okay, A is going to be a vector of length phi. Although you have, may have initially three values, you can try to predict what will be the largest uh, size the vector need to accommodate. Um, uh, the advantage of this is then you will be populating the vector, but you will not be having multiple copies of the vector in, in memory. Again, it depends. If, if your vectors are not too big, the previous methods are not so bad. Okay, but just warning you in the case that you really have a very big vector with, if you have a lot of data, that may be your case. Another way is to create the, to use the rep function and initialize all the elements in zero or the NA, remember the NA indicator we saw a couple of lectures ago, that will be another way. And then you go and, and, and select, you know that there are five elements in this vector. So you select the specific index of the vector that you want to put a particular value and you do that. And then you ask, and then you know the previous ones are zero or NA. Uh, but in this case, um, you don't have two floating copies of the vector at the same time when you need to append more data to the vector. Not everyone will run into this problem by just saying that's another way of creating a vector. Okay. okay. Uh, DNA, I think, I think we talk about DNA, but if not, we, we are going to, to come back to NA. Uh, let's say that we want to add three new elements. Let's say that we took A from being this last one that was generated with repetition of zeros. And then in the fourth and fifth place, we put the value four and five. Okay, so our vector is zero, 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 four, five. And now let's say that we are going to use this technique of adding a new element of the vector, but in position um, that will be eight, I believe. So we have the original vector, the length is five, plus three, give me eight. So in the position A, I'm going to put the value of nine, okay? So now if I look at the vector A, what happened is I have three zeros, four and five, then two NAs, and then number nine, because I put in position A number nine. The reason why R puts this NAs is because it doesn't really know what type of data you have there, right? You are asking just R to put in position X a given value. And in the middle, it doesn't know what to put. So NAs is not a bad call, it's, it means not data available. That's what it means. The funny thing with R is it's very good handling NA and NA shows up a lot in real data. When you are doing survey data or even experimental data, not always you will have a value if the experiment fail or there were no recordings of whatever thing you are measuring. So there is a function called is NA and you can inquire or use this function with whatever structure you have, like a vector for instance. And it will tell you if there is any NAs. For instance, in this vector A, we have two NAs in position six and seven, and that is where the true shows up. So you can ask where there are data that are is not NA by using the exclamation sign. That basically switches or, or, or turns a false into a true or a true into a false. And then A of not NA give you the actual values of the vector, zero, 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 four, five, and nine, okay? One thing to be aware of with NAs is that they will break many of the functions that we usually use. So the sum function basically adds all the numbers in a vector. And so in this case, it will be 18. But if I do sum of the vector, because there are NAs there, it, it says, okay, there is places where I don't know what the data is. So how can I sum this? So the way to fix that is to use the sum function and indicate that this flag na.rm equal true means remove the NAs. So perform the sum, but ignore the, RA, the NAs uh, floating in the data, okay? Super handy, many of the functions, minimum, maximum, sum, average, all of these functions has this flag. And it's because in many cases, we may, we may be dealing with data that may have some NAs floating on it, okay? Any questions about this? All right, a few more things. Um, as, you may, as you may have seen right now, there are many functions. Every day we introduce new functions in, in our lectures. And not always you need to be familiar with the functions. Um, but if I mention a function or you find yourself looking for a function and you find a function, one thing you can always ask is for help in R. 
is, is all the functions so should be well documented if they are part of R or any, any package in CRAN. And so you can do help and the name of the function and a lot of information will show up there. So let me show you, let me show you an example of this. Um, I'm going to bring my, my terminal again here. And if we have my terminal somewhere, just a second. I just want to show you how, how does it look like um, the help function. This on the side, and this one here. There we go. I'm going to open R again. So I was saying about the sum function. So if I do help sum, now it gives you more information about what the sum function does. It returns the sum of all the values present in its argument. These dots represents the argument. And you see here the flag na.rm and equal false mean that by default, the value of that argument is, is false. Okay, but, um, but if you want to change it, you just do na equal dot rm equal true. So for instance, I was saying a is repetitions of zero five times. Then I say a of four is four, a of five was five. So that's a, a. and then a of length of a. So just to let you know, length of a will give five. And then plus three is eight. So a of length of a plus a equal nine. Now it gives us that. So we were trying to do the sum of A and we were getting an A. So we can do an A remove equal true and then we get over 18. Okay, that was the example. But again, the help of any function, so in this case, help of sum, give you a, a more detailed description of what the function does, what other arguments the function has. For exiting the help, you press Q in the terminal. In many operating systems, in Windows, and I think in Mac OS as well, when you use the R interface, it opens a new window or it opens the help in a browser. So you can keep both open, but if you're running the terminal, that's how it looks like. Okay. All right. Um, oh, that's another interesting one. I forgot about this one. You can use the example function on functions. So the example function will bring examples that the function has documented for the user. So example of sum, and then it shows you whenever it says the name of the function and then greater than is, is an example from this function. So sum of one to five, sum of numbers, sum of uh, two vectors, and, and so on. Uh, and you can see here, they explicitly sum in an NA and that's why they get an A unless you, you turn on NA dot remove equal true. Okay, but very handy function to look at. Sometimes the examples are more clarifying than the description itself it happens with some complicated functions. So something to bear in mind, okay? So example function. A few more things about vectors. Um, to sprinkle this a little bit. Vectors behave pretty much as we will expect. So for instance, if you had uh, Let's do this a little bit more interactive. At least I feel like you guys are seeing this live. So if we say A is one to five plus one, what you will get is the range of one to five plus one. So one to five give us one to five, and then plus one is being added to all the single elements. So this behavior in R is called recycling. Uh, so we have originally another way to decompose this is, okay, let's say A is one to five. So now A is one, two, three, four, and five. But if I do A plus one, it's adding one to every single element in the vector. So it's recycling the value of one over every single element in the vector, okay? Alternately, one could have done repetitions of one as many elements as A has, and it's the same result. But it's shorter to say A plus one. All right. Um, another thing, we saw the repetition command, repetition of two five times, give you choose five times. And we can do assign this to a vector uh, B, two comma five. So B is two times, is two five times. And then we can multiply A times B. So A was one, two, three, four, and five. 
in my light example, in the example in the terminal, in the slice was one, five plus one, oops, 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 that way. So two, three, four, five, six. So that's why I multiply I, uh, sorry, A times B, I get four, six, seven, 10, 12. It's multiplying each single element, the first one with the first one, second with the second one, and so on. So it's multiplication element wise, as we call it. You can use other mathematical functions, the final sign, if you wish, for computing the sinusoidal function of the vector. So it takes each element of the vector and applies the, the, the operation. You can take the square root of the vector and it will apply the square root to every single element in the vector. Okay, We can define a vector d, for instance, being a uh, times a, that's a squared, and then take the square root of d, and that should be equal to a. Okay, so mathematical operations apply element-wise in vectors, as you will expect. Okay. Um, one more thing I mentioned, this is why vectors are part of this lecture, is whenever it's possible, use vectors instead of looping. That is because we're using vectorization. Vectors and slicing are way more powerful and efficient than uh, looping and conditionals. So whenever it's possible, operate over the whole vector. So an example here is A going from three to seven, B going from six to 10, E is repetition of zeros. Um, we saw the sequence alone. I, I mentioned it wasn't my other examples, but here it is again. So if you, let's say you want to multiply A times B. We can just do A times B as we saw element wise. Instead, you could do the multiplication of element by element sequencing along the indices. So that will be what you will do in a primitive, what I will call, and people will get mad at me, but a primitive uh, programming language where you need to loop over every single element in the vector and perform the operation. Modern programming languages, more efficient, more easy to implement, has this advantage of implementing vectorization in a symbolic manner by doing the product of the vectors. The results are the same, the vectorized version is way more efficient, faster and cleaner to look and, and, and write, less error prone, basically. Okay. So our summary for today, we saw the uh, looping constructors, four loops, by far the most useful ones. You may use while loops. The difference between one and the other is in the for loops, you know a priori how many iterations you expect to have because you are going to be looping over certain elements in a set. The while loops is when you don't know a priori how many iterations you will have and you will loop until a certain condition is equal. Conditionals given by the if statement used to ask questions and allow the code to make decisions, do this or do that depending on a condition. Vectors, homogeneous data type, Performance driven, meaning that they are very efficient. Whenever it's possible, you should be using vectors. Avoid looping and instead use slicing and vectors. The, the reason is vectorization. We saw the NA is, is a not available uh, wildcard that you can use, super useful for real data. And then functions to consider to use whenever you are exploring new functions, the help and example functions. Okay. I think that's all what I have for you guys today. Any questions about today? And I repeat, any questions about the assignment, which is due on a week from now, almost next Monday at midnight. Next Monday, I'm going to be presenting a new assignment, assignment number two. Office hours are going to be this coming Friday at 1 p.m. And again, I repeat this. I think I mentioned at the beginning, it's not part of the recording though. The, the assignment Dropbox closes at 11.55 p.m. on Monday. So don't wait until midnight, okay? And don't wait until the end to start working on the assignment. It's not a difficult assignment, but again, if it is the first time, some things may, may be a little bit more challenging. You may need to, to spend a little bit more of time. Please do not wait until last minute to start working on the assignment, okay? And feel free to ask questions either on the forum, by email or on the office hours. And if you, uh, if the time doesn't work for you, and I apologize, last, last Friday I, I had to cancel the, the, or move, not cancel, but move the office hours to a different time slot, but if you, the time doesn't work for you, please email me and, and we can find a time where, where you can ask questions as well. So don't feel free, don't feel bad for, for asking about that neither, okay? 
Just ask for help if you, if you need help with the assignments. All right. Any questions at all from the assignments, from today's lectures or previous lectures? All right, so then um, it doesn't look like we do have any questions. So um, I think this is it for today, guys. I will see you on office hours on Friday uh, or otherwise next next week. Oh, we have a question, Sina. For the test function in assignment one, do we have to print or just call the functions? Um, so let me, let's go back to the assignment. I think it's a good question. Let's try to clarify that. And, and the reason why I want to go back to the assignment is because I think I put, as soon as I can <laughs> leave my, my full screen mode here. Why is not allowing me to do that? One second. Just want to bring um, the assignment description. So uh, to answer your question in the meanwhile, um, both things, uh, Sina, both things. You, you, you may need to, uh, you will have to call the functions certainly, but they also would like you to print uh, some of the results. So let me, let me bring this back here. Share this in a second. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Let's print the description of the assignment. It's, it's a good question indeed. So this is the assignment that you guys are working with. And what Sina is asking for is the second part, third part actually, where we're going to test our functions. So what, what I want you to see is um, when I when I execute your 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 testing script, what I want to see is the output of this. So for instance, the quadratic equation function. Um, so if, if you go to the quadratic equation function, what happens is um, the quadratic equation function returns something. It doesn't print on the screen anything, right? Just returns something. That's why if I want to see what is the output of quadratic equation, then I assign to a variable and then I print that. So in that case, you are doing both things. You are, you are calling the function and also printing because I want to see that. But the, one, the, the reason why I want to clarify this is notice what happened with the blueberry muffins recipe function. In the blueberry muffin, and that's why I also include the example here. It's, it's, a, it's a subtle point, but it's an interesting point. And this comes back to the difference between return and print statement. Okay, that's why it's, it's, it's done on purpose. This function returns something, but also prints something in the screen. So this is the output of calling the function blueberry muffins is returning something into a variable, which then I can ex ex explore using STR, but it's also printing the recipe in the screen, okay? So to be, to be concrete about Sina's question, for the quadratic equation, what I'm going to expect is either a direct call to the function and a print around that, or a direct call to the function and assign it to a variable and printing, but attention here, for the blue Mary muffin function, you don't need to do the printing explicitly because the function will print that for you on the screen. However, you will need to assign the function to something, otherwise it will duplicate the information on the screen. Um, does, does clarify um, the question? Yeah, so exactly, exactly. I think, I, I, I think Shim got the point. Um, the blueberry muffin function duplicates the information. That's exactly, the, it's not exactly the same, but because it's returning something, it's also, unless you capture that and put in a, fa in a variable, uh, you, you will get that displayed twice, okay? A good question, guys. all right. And again, this was by design. It was on purpose to differentiate the effect of printing or, or, or when you will use print versus when you will use uh, return. Okay, something that we also discussed a little bit in, in class. All right, good question. Uh, any other questions?
Okay. All right then. Um, so again, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask by email in the forum. The forum is a great tool because you may find um, more people with similar questions or uh, in the office hours as well, all right? So if you don't have any more questions, then I'm going to, um, we're going to stop uh, now and I will see you on Friday or, or next weekend during lecture time.